Hello, happy Wednesday. Welcome to the next edition of the Wednesday Wisdom Series. My name is Ali Taylor. I am the founder and consultant at Wisdom and Wayfinder, where we help you find a clear path to growth and profitability. Uh, Unless you have discovered the secret to everlasting life, you don't have enough time to learn everything there is uh, to learn about running, growing, and scaling a business on your own. And so this series is where experienced professionals come and share their wisdom about how to do that. Today, I'm here with Mike Farragher, CEO and founder of Career Letters, and we're going to be diving deep into the art and science of professional branding and executive resume building. Uh, Mike has a rich background in senior commercial leadership within Fortune 100 companies and a passion for storytelling. And today, Mike is going to share some invaluable insights on how to stand out in today's competitive job market, uh, from leveraging the power of keywords for AI and recruitment algorithms to personal branding and leadership effectiveness. Uh, I think you will enjoy his unique perspective on navigating career transitions and scaling your professional growth. And we'll also dive into some of his creative storytelling pursuits as it relates to all things Irish culture. Mike, thank you for being here today. I think with all that big introduction, we're out of time. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that introduction. That was great. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I took some time to practice it. I was like, Mike. Well, you were in front of the mirror on that one. I could tell. I I was. I was like, he's the chief storytelling officer, so I got to make sure. You better like up the game. (laughs) Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. You too. Well, speaking of upping the game, um, you know, just share a little bit about how did you transition from, I know you have your work in the corporate field, but what made you decide to use your talents and your experience and your gifts towards the resume writing and executive um, career building? Yeah, it's a great question. So I can take you back to January of, oh no, July of 2020. And um, I was working for a large fortune 100 company and due to some shifts in the business with COVID, I was laid off. Um, And on the same day I was laid off that July, my mother-in-law passed away of COVID. Mm. So by all measures, thank you. Uh, By all measures, that was, I'm an optimist, but by all measures, that was a really bad day, right? So I remember specifically with my wife, Barbara, who's a co-founder of Career Letters with me, you know, we sat there on the porch and we said, you know, we can, thank God we have the financial means to weather out the rest of the year, grieve, heal, be with the family, whatever we needed. So nobody would find fault with us doing that. Or it's July 1st or thereabouts. We have the rest of the year to create a banger year. What are we going to do? And we both had the same thinking that let's, you know, go with the feels, but let's not write off the rest of the year. So, um, being a writer and being a Fortune 50 hiring manager and also writing some of the books that I've written that are humorous, I typically get a number of requests around writing. The first one is, hey, can you help me with your resume? And then the other one is, hey, can you help me with my dating profile? You know, you're funny and can you kind of punch that up? So long story short, my wife had the idea to say, you know, there are people that are charging folks online for dating writing, profile writing. You're writing out of the back of napkins for free drinks at a bar with some of my (laughs) single friends. Like you could be making a business out of that. And then also we, you know, wanted to really take a look at what was missing in the resume writing and professional branding part. So after doing some of that research, just hanging the shingles. So we had career letters for resume writing and love letters profiles for dating profile writing. And I know we're here to talk about career letters, but I just want to do one quick thing, detour about love letters. Yeah, yeah, go for it. As you can imagine, I got some of the craziest, wildest dating stories as a result of talking with people about where, you know, love has not found them. And what I did was there was one in particular that was so offbeat and hilarious. I said, I have to make a script out of this. So I made a script out of it. It wins the London Screenwriting Festival for best comedy. 
So I decided to produce it. And then it went on to win some awards for uh, at the film festivals for best comedy, best actor, best writer. And I share that story with anybody that might be listening, that might be in a career crosswords, crossroads or crossroads, whatever. Um, out of that darkest day, if you told me a year later, I'd be on the festival circuit with a best script from London screenwriting and a film that's running around the festivals, I mean, that just wasn't even <laughs> in the radar. I was in grief mode. I was shocked, everything else. But a year later, there I was. So out of that darkest day came this incredible new chapter in my life that I couldn't have imagined. So I, I, I do ask people to really be open to any and all possibilities that might be before you and not just jump back into what I know and what's safe if you find yourself impacted um, by a layoff or a divestiture or whatever. Yeah, that's so incredibly important. There are two, a couple of things that I that I, I liked about what you shared in terms of just the way that you and Barbara decided to look at what you were going through to take that pain and that grief uh, that you were experiencing and using that to channel it into something positive and creative out into the world. Like one, I, I, I think people who do that, who have that kind of ability are superheroes in their, in their own right. Um, just like a real force for good to be able to do that. Um, but then also just touching upon how I, I, I think love, you know, dating is the same energy or frequency as like, you know, money and looking for a career, right? It's the same type of effort energy that you're putting into it and trying to find where can you really express yourself? Where can you really show up inside of these two different avenues and being able to write your own story out of, you know, layoffs, a breakup, a divorce, et cetera. It's that same, like same energy that, that tends to happen. So I love the way that you and Barb decided to approach that and use your stuff to make that positive influence and that positive impact. It, 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 very, very perceptive on your part. It's the same story. People wonder like, well, that's, how could you, like I, I actually offered life packages where I would do your dating profile and your resume for one low price, whatever. And people were like, those are so different, but not really because, you know, I'm not saying this about everybody, but if you find yourself out of a job for a while, or single for a while, and you don't want to be, you're, it's the same things you're going to say in your head. I'm damaged goods. Nobody's going to want me. It's, you know, the list goes on. And every one of those disempowering contexts is keeping you from getting what you want. So part of the career letters and the love letters for that matter is certainly writing you know, being clever and funny on a dating profile or coming up with the, you know, really packing in the keywords to get the searches you want from LinkedIn. A lot of it's writing and skill. And a lot of what I do is coaching and counseling. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on TV, but um, people really need a confidence boost because if they lost a job or if they've in some case, in some cases, lost uh, a significant other through death or breakup, th their confidence has taken a hit and an employer can see right through that. You know, when you're on a yeah. Zoom or stream yard like we are now, an employer can see right through that. So it's, I can do everything I possibly can to get you the interview, but the rest is up to you. You have to sell it once you're on a Zoom call or in front of a boardroom. And then similar, you know, I could put the bait on the hook for the daters. You've got to wiggle the hook in the water, right? So, and both of those do well, require- you, Well, first you got to go decide to go fishing, right? That you're yes. even going to go fishing to begin with. That's right. That's right. So, um, but yeah, but people won't make that leap. And, you know, going over to the career part of it, people not only make that, won't make that leap, but they'll also not leap high enough. Mm. So when you look at 
a job description, like a lot of people will go, oh, I could do my boss's job. I, you know, I could do, I'm ta more talented <laughs> than he is or she is. Okay, well, why don't we put your boss's job, find that job description online somewhere in some mm -hmm. job board, compare and contrast that to your experience. And a lot of times that person's right. They could do your boss's job. So if you did get laid off, why not go for your boss's job or higher if you're qualified for it? And sometimes that that's the coaching I would do in career letters. Yeah, there are a lot of ways in which people hold themselves back. Um, and I think what's really powerful about what you do is that even though you're the chief you know, storytelling officer, you're the one doing the writing, you're really empowering them to sort of rewrite their own narrative, or at least their the experience of their own story uh, when it comes to their career or even their dating profile, their love life. Yeah, or make them present to their own innate greatness, you know, that I yeah. am very marketable, either as a, mm -hmm. as a dater or a lover or as a, a candidate. Um, yeah. And I, I have had that feedback from some of the recruiters that I've worked on, I, I do have some relationships with, you know, large recruiter networks, and they come to me with like, Oh, my God, this, this person's resume was faxed over to me. And it's like, <laughs> from the 90s, <laughs> they haven't looked for a job in 37 years, help. So I'll, I'll step yeah. in, you know, and uh, you, you do find that uh, sometimes the feedback I'll get was that, wow, that person's confidence was here, and you brought them here. And what did you do? And, you know, it's, it's, it goes from, am I marketable to your GD right? I'm marketable, you know, and I'll let you yeah. fill in the blanks there, you know, that, yeah, I'm marketable. And, um, that's a part of it. That's extremely rewarding. Uh, I, I, I will say that one of the things that taught that I was taught after the layoff was mm -hmm. really looking at, and I'm, I'm at a certain age where I'm, you know, I got a number, a few years left to retire, still have to work. But one of the things that I kind of came up with was, what's your mission statement? You know, every time you go to a company, mm. the company will have their mission statement. Why do you, why do we exist? What, well, why do you exist? And then doing that work and finding a job that would attract that is a bonus. I have a very good friend of mine that has gone through gene and cell, gene and cell therapy okay. because his cancer came back mm. and he knock on wood has beat it again. And he has newly invigorated to be an advocate for patient voices in the pharma industry. So now he's pursuing jobs that would put him in a position to do that. So for me, my mission statement is aspire to inspire and the universe will take notice. So it's Ooh, really not about, it's not about like how many resumes can I write? It's how many people can I reach? Mm -hmm. If I help a mother or a father get a job and find financial security, I'm touching the lives of countless people, families I've never known. And that really becomes my North Star when I have myself bouts of confidence, because let's face it, we're human. Yeah. But when I have my own bouts of confidence, I really look at that North Star and say, are you right now inspiring to inspire? And is the universe taking notice? And what do you need to do if you're not that? Get yourself back in that headspace. So I find that... Um, as you're going back to the job market or looking to change careers or looking to sh switch industries, you know, having your own mission statement, what, what's my life for? And having a career commensurate with that, that's, that's what work-life balance is really about. Cause then it won't feel like work when you're working all night. And I don't, you know, I work, I have clients in Europe. I have clients in China. Yeah. It doesn't feel like work to me. My day job doesn't feel like work to me. This doesn't feel like work to me because it's all inside of a work-life balance that I've attained over the years.
yeah, it's all in service to the mission statement, the mission that you've really created for your life. Um, and that reminds me of I have this book, um, Her on a Mission, which is written by Donald Miller. But really, it's like looking at your whole life, like you said, creating a mission statement for yourself. Like, yeah, the company has a mission statement. They have their vision. But what's yours? Right. And does the job or the jobs that you're applying to, is your resume written in a way that actually services that mission? I think a lot of a lot of people, a lot of candidates today are very hopeless in some aspects because they haven't taken the time to really create that mission for themselves. And they think they're just resigned to whatever job is available because, you know, they've got to you've got to pay the rent. You got to you got to take care of the, the kids or the dog and the, the bills and all those other things. And I think where a lot of people shortchange themselves is that they don't have that personal mission and they don't find those things that align with that personal mission. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, you know, if you don't want, if you don't know what you want, ultimately it's, you know, it's going to be a very hollow life um, when you're out there looking for a new, new job. Um, and you can, you know, it's funny. Um, I can't remember who said this. I think it was Jim Carrey. He said, every actor should win an Oscar as soon as possible so that they realize that ain't it. That's not what you're <laughs> yes. saying. Yeah. So, you know, I have, I have plenty of people that I, I coach in my leadership coaching and training where, you know, oh my God, I, I was like, I was number two in the country and I was like, oh my God, I'm number two in the country and like beating yourself up. I was like, yeah, yeah, but you were in the diamond club. You blew yeah. out your number. And every one of those is a milestone that you never celebrated. So if being number, not being number one is, is the only thing you're heading towards that year after year, that's, that's a, that's a hole or a trap that just doesn't have any cheese in it after a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's an endless black hole. That reminds so, me. So of you should, you should, you should win. You should win diamond club salesperson of the year yeah. once early on to realize yeah. that ain't it. Yeah. It's not the thing that's going to, that's going to make ain't you. It. Yeah. 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 I had a conversation the other night with, um, uh, a woman who works with a lot of ultra high net worth individuals. And she, one of her famous lines, or, or at least that I've, that I, it's famous to me, uh, is that money only solves money problems. And so she's working with a lot of these people who have access to wealth and luxury that, you know, most of us will could only ever imagine or dream of and the identity struggles that they, that they come across similar to you and I everyday people right if you're having girl problems i feel bad for you sir i got 99 <laughs> problems i mean i'm not going to finish that but yeah, yeah. it's right <laughs> to quote the great jay-z <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> it ain't it <laughs> bet you didn't think that was going to happen today did you no i wasn't going to bring out some jay-z just willy-nilly anyway <laughs> Listen, you are you are tapped into a lot of different cultures and, and whatnot. And I want to I want to talk about some of the, uh, the Irish culture stuff that you do as well. Um, but first, I want to just jump back to, you know, what's like in your work with with a lot of the candidates that you're seeing. And it comes to like their LinkedIn profile, for say, uh, what are some of the, the most egregious mistakes that you're seeing people make when it comes to their LinkedIn, to their uh, the way they present themselves online? Well, I would probably answer that slightly different where maybe mm -hmm. I'd go through the process of what I do when I'm trying okay. to attract a client and it's, uh, I don't yeah, do a so hard let's... sell. I don't do a yeah. hard sell. I, I ask them one simple question. If a customer, a future employer or a business prospect landed on your LinkedIn profile, would that be what you'd want them to see? Yes or no? Mm. Yeah. And then I bring it up and it's like, first of all, it looks like Casper, the friendly ghost. There's no profile picture there. So it's just <laughs> that white outline. 
it's even paler yeah. than I am. By the way, can you tell I'm Irish? Look at this. Look at this big tam complexion in the in the Zoom light. But um, so that's the first thing I ask. Like, there's no profile picture. And if there's anything mm -hmm. worse than no profile picture, it's the profile picture of the mirrored sunglasses holding up a big base, you know, bat, you know, like a big tuna fish. <laughs> With the, yeah. with the trucker cap and you're like, well, unless you're going out to be a big game fisherman, that image of your profile picture is not in line with what you're trying to attract. So sometimes we yeah. do, I do re recommend, and I do work with um, some profile picture takers so that you have yeah. a professional look. So <laughs> you, just like people judge a book by its cover and my author pursuits, they certainly judge a book by its image. So is that in line? And then the other thing that I think is well, the Venn diagram, the Venn diagram of profile pictures of guys holding fish and wearing the sunglasses for LinkedIn and uh, their dating profiles is a circle. Just, just so oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah. the other one, like I really looked, I really looked really, really good in that suit, but unfortunately, yeah. it's got my. Um, I have my arm around my ex-wife or ex-girlfriend, yeah. so the arms <laughs> cut out. I mean, on both yeah. profile pictures for dating and LinkedIn, I've seen them like it's the same picture in some of the clients oh, I've worked wow. on. I'm like, oh my God, really? <laughs> so the, <laughs> the other thing that I think is 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 egregious as well is that, uh, you know, when you have a little bit of gray on your temples, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people fancy themselves as a mentor, you know? So it's like, oh, you know, I help people. I help, I'm a VP and I help people, you know, uh, aspire to their careers and there's just going to be all that talk about it. And then you get to the bottom of their LinkedIn profile and they mm -hmm. haven't recommended one person and mm. nobody's recommended them. Yeah. So it's not bad or wrong, but it's inconsistent with who you say you are. If you don't have people coming back to you and go and publicly writing on your profile, thank you for you know, you help me make my sales goal. You help me get promoted. Yeah. You help me do this. And then also sprinkle the love as well. I, I call it um, practicing random acts of acknowledgement. Mm. And I suggest that clients do this. Typically, 4th of July weekend, the week between Christmas and New Year's where people are, you know, kind of just trolling LinkedIn just because they're bored. Yeah. Write a, write a paragraph or two on somebody that you're like, wow, that that teacher, that mentor, that person really set me straight. I wouldn't be here where I am without them. Who is that person? You can go on their profile, write a few sentences on what that person meant for you so that the world knows it. And it's good karma. Nobody lost a job because of good karma. And it goes back to what I said earlier aspire to inspire and the universe takes notice. If you put that kind of karma out there, then when you are down yeah. on your luck in, in getting a job, you have all those people that remember like, wow, that, that, that guy wrote on my page and gave me a recommendation. I'm going to see if I can find him a job here. Karma, doing something like that without expecting anything back, mm -hmm. you will get a lot back. And I do tell people yeah. that if you're putting yourself out there as a mentor, where would I see that digitally? So that's yeah. the other. Where's the, where's the evidence? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the, apart from the tuna fish picture, profile picture, <laughs> that would be the most egregious thing I see on LinkedIn profiles, especially when you're touting yourself as a mentor, when you haven't mm -hmm. demonstrated it digitally that you are. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really important, especially now, to start giving people their flowers before before their funeral. Um, yeah. Start, you know, acknowledging people for the difference that they've made for you, whether it's, you know, and even if you've never actually worked with someone or if they've done something, if they said something that has made a difference for you, go ahead and do that. In fact, I actually had that happen to me uh, very unexpectedly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I went to a networking, I'm part of a Latip group. And so I went to one of the networking uh, events at another chapter. And there was someone that I had met over Christmas. We had a conversation and he was telling me how he changed up his whole Instagram strategy because of something that I had said that night. 
I don't even remember what I said, but it it made such a difference for him and how he was showing up online and it really influenced him. And then other people started taking notice and he, you know, made it a point to to let me know. And I tell you, it was such a gift to have that, to hear that acknowledgement from him and to see the way that he's been showing up online. And it's like, trust me, it makes a difference if you could do that for people. Yeah. It also gives you a bit of a jump scare, <laughs> scare, doesn't it? Because you're like, I said that? Boy, that's pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, when did I say that? <laughs> yeah, it's like, damn, Maybe I need I to start take recording. The again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Awesome. All right. So let's dive into I, I, you did mention that you are of higher Irish heritage. Um, and so I'd like to know a little bit more about like, how do you weave that into your storytelling? And, and given the awards that you've won recently, you know, obviously I've been keeping up with that. Uh, why do you think it resonates with people so much? Well, I think on, on LinkedIn, people, people will always tell me, I'll get a lot of DMs, especially in the last post I did where I, I won a, a, a best film award at a film festival recently, like, how do you do that? And like work full time and do your day job and like, like, do you sleep and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, my answer to that is anything that's meaningful to you is going to be on your calendar yes. and you'll find a way. So yeah. I have plenty of examples, which I've learned, but from mentors, by the way, of, you know, senior vice presidents that were with me in Cologne, Germany for a meeting at Bear, flew over there and right back home to meet, to go to their daughter's championship lacrosse game. Mm -hmm. That's a person that knows what's important, providing for his family and showing up for his family. Um, I never forgot that. So yeah. if it's meaningful for you, it'll be on the calendar. For me, um, you know, writing is to Mike what fish is to water and breathing. It's mm. just what I need to breathe. Um, yeah. I've, you know, and the, the employers that get that, I thrive under. And the employers that don't get that, I don't work for them. Yeah. Um, one of my most recent um, positions that I had, um, I, I got this job over they said 30 other applicants. So they were all like PhDs in chemists and I'm not, I graduated some of them lucky uh, from, uh, <laughs> from <Hopkins> Harvard <laughs> university. <laughs> um, and I was like, why did you hire me? Cause I'm in these meetings and yeah. we're talking about, you know, hepatocytes and we're talking about livers and all this, the work, what? And his answer was, you know, he said, um, I have plenty of chemists and biochemists and biologists. I don't have any writers. So these mm. scientists can't always tell the story of why this is important. So I thought, let me throw a writer in the mix yeah, and see what that does. And, you know, for a CEO to, for a CEO to acknowledge that I thought was, really took me back. It's something I've always thought, but that's really where, you know, I know that the word diversity gets thrown around, but it's not just diversity in age, race, or creed. It's also diversity mm -hmm. in experiences where if you're top loaded with a lot of chemists and biochemists and they can't really talk to people, then you know, there is a place for a writer to be the storyteller and to, to frame the importance of this to customers when we're dealing with commercial negotiations. So, yeah. um, so I, I think part of it is, is to, I write because that's what I need to do in my life. And then over the years, I've been grateful that I've been working for mentors and companies that see that they appreciate it. And many years I was a closeted writer where I'd keep that off of LinkedIn and now I don't. And I run yeah. 
memoir writing classes at Monmouth University on Zoom since the pandemic. I can't tell you how many bosses and senior people I've had over the last couple of years, former and current, that have mm -hmm. come to my classes because they see me doing it, they want it for themselves, and they put themselves in a class to understand how to get started. So I think there's a lot of closeted writers on LinkedIn that look at those posts and go, I want to do that. It's all about putting a schedule together and getting it done. Yeah, that's so very, very true. Um, you know, what what matters to you is going to get scheduled. It's going to be a, become a priority. Um, it's that old saying, it's like, yeah, if it if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. Right? Yeah, there will be yeah. the there'll be the next show to, to binge watch. There's always the doom scrolling on TikTok that's available for you at any given point in time. But until you get real with yourself, real honest with yourself about how important something is to you, it's not going to go into your calendar and you're not going to organize your life in service of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times that I'll just use, you know, I'll use, I hope I don't embarrass you when I tell you this, but you know, yeah. I've seen pictures of you on Facebook and on LinkedIn and there's pictures of you at the gym. And there was one that, you know, you were all ripped and you look like a superhero. Um, <laughs> You know, and I was like, you know, I think you even had a Superman shirt on, as I recall, because we're both, you know, yeah. comic book, we're comic book nerds. We don't, that's a whole other <laughs> podcast. But anyway, you know, there's a lot of people that are runners mm -hmm. yourself, um, you know, that, that obviously your health and fitness is among your top priorities in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't look the way you do. Um, I'd like to look like that. I don't. I <laughs> And, you know. That's why I'm yeah. coming out with a book called <clears throat> My One Skinny Summer uh, <laughs> this summer because I've only ever had one. Um, but, you know, it's it's um, if if I took the intensity I have with writing into health and fitness, I'd have the results you do. Mm -hmm. So for many people, they have intensity somewhere to be a yeah. runner or to be the best woodworker or they're the or they're they do you know they compete on professional dog you know the dog show circuit i you know plenty of people have those side hustles that they're intense about and it's just a matter of taking that intense person over here and putting them into another category and having those results so people that want to write that look like you mm -hmm. <laughs> if you took that same <laughs> level of intensity in the gym and just yeah. wrote a few words a day you'd have it done yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing too is is it doesn't always have to be I, I think a lot of people feel like they they're just stuck with one track, right? Like, okay, I can only be this way because that is what I'm used to. That's all that I know. Uh, and they don't want to do the shitty sucky parts of of sucking at first, right? Failing at first. You know, because there were those moments early on, um, you know, I used to be 50 pounds heavier and, you know, I had to change my, my eating habits. I had to change my sleeping habits. I had to, you know, get up early and go do that and make that commitment regardless of what the weather was like outside. And it, it sucked a lot. <laughs> but once you get into that groove, you, you start to find a pattern to where, I guess, you know, just your your brain finally switches on. It's like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we need. We got to keep this momentum going. And so, yeah, when it comes to writing, your first drafts are going to suck. <laughs> but I think people need to give themselves permission to suck at first, and we don't do that enough. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, also, certainly, you know, people can go on my social medias and they could see I have a book signing tonight. Um mm -hmm. You know, this past Sunday, I was, you know, I won that award. So you'd be like, wow, yeah. Mike, that's like, that's pretty incredible. It is pretty incredible. But what yeah. you also don't hear is that I applied to 12 festivals. I got into two. Yeah. yeah. You're going to see the red carpet pictures of the two. Maybe I should be speaking a little bit more about the 10 I didn't get into. Um, I've gone to mm -hmm. book signings where I've literally spoken at Lincoln Center uh, mm -hmm. across the lawn. There was thousands of people there. And then there was times I drove all the way up to Boston and 
six people showed up, you know? So, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you, you definitely never mind the writing process, but also once you get these things to fruition, uh, there's, that's where the real work begins in that you're looking to always find an audience and, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you don't lose money. Maybe I'm not going to make a lot of money, but I don't want to lose money doing these films and books. So keeping an eye on the bottom line, that's equally as important as getting the first draft done, yeah. which I really, <laughs> I really enjoy. I, my, some of my, some of my creative heroes are not necessarily writers They're It's, you know, I'm a huge Rolling Stones fan, you know, Mick Jagger, uh, mm -hmm. Bono's the same way, you know, Mick Jagger is the creative. He puts the tour together. He writes the albums with Keith. And uh, when it comes time to tour, he knows the city in which the tour breaks even and the profitability starts. He's got that. like. Yeah. So it's like it's the London school, out. London school of economics <laughs> over here, creative <laughs> over here. Those I have many, many friends, you being one of them, um, mm -hmm. that that I, I really admire people that have that left brain, right brain um, to to not only create something, but manage the creative business, the business of creativity, because it's it's called show business for a reason. Yeah, a thousand percent. I um Oh man. So I've been watching uh The Marvelous Miss Maisel. Uh, I just mm. started watching that for the first. I'm like, damn, the show's really good. And one of the things that I really liked is they showed the process of her workshopping the jokes and, and trying them out and uh seeing which ones landed, which ones didn't. Um and she had to do a lot of really crappy, you know, greasy, low down and dirty dive bars in order to really practice and hone her skill. And I think with a lot of people, you know, a lot of people with their job searches, you know, like you were talking about the the 10 uh, shows that you didn't get into, you know, we don't always see all of the rejections from submitting that application, submitting that, that resume. Yeah. Um, we don't see all the failures that come up, we just see, you know, the success and finally when they get the corner office or they get the job and their first paycheck, et cetera, we celebrate with them. But yeah, there is well, so much of that that goes unseen. Well, there is certainly also um, uh, in right now for the date that we're recording this job market mm -hmm. is pretty good. It's tightening up in some areas, not in others, which is kind of the story of life. Right. But mm -hmm. I look back on, on the last two jobs that I got, I sent out 60 applications and this is a guy that's kind of a pro at interviewing and a pro at, you know, optimizing LinkedIn and resume profiles. So I can, I can do the best job on your resume or LinkedIn profile ever. And yeah, it, it there's because of technology and the LinkedIn easy apply button, as an example, people are just going to like be in their pajamas going, yeah, I'll apply for that. Click, <laughs> click, click. So the, yeah. the, the the result of that is that almost every job out there has, you know, 40 applications and they're looking for one person. So there you have it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to be prepared that if you wanted to make a, uh, a job switch or if you're out of work, mm -hmm. I tell people that it's, you know, it's four to six months to find something else between pummeling the job market mm. for job applications, waiting for somebody to get back from vacation to do that third Zoom interview, going through four or five interviews and you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, if you're if you're gonna take one more hour of my time, I'm gonna 1099 you for it. Just give me the job already. <laughs> that's part of the process and it really is. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think one of the, I forgot when you were telling me this story, but you were, I think maybe it was with your niece that you had given her some coaching in her interview uh, to ask, you know, the CEO, it's like, like, what is it that they need or, or something like that? Do you remember that story? Yeah. 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 Uh, my goddaughter who uh, goddaughter that's found, awesome. found herself laid off, uh, not laid off. Her position was eliminated. Um, so, obviously going through the shock of that. And she was, you know, one of those things where she got glowing reviews, uh, 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 you know, of 
just a couple of months before, and then all of a sudden they eliminated her position. Why yeah. me? I was like, first of all, the answer is there's no logic behind it. They're just no longer yeah. in X business or Y business. They're it's like a it's like a waterbed. We're gonna blow it up here and deflate it over there or whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll wait till people Google what the waterbed reference is because people of a certain age will have no idea what a waterbed is. But <laughs> anyway, um, so then, you know, during the, during the interview session, I, I coached her to say, what does, what are the things you're measured by Mr. Hiring Manager yeah. by yeah. success? And what were things in my, credentials that you saw as an opportunity for me to contribute especially if a yeah. person of a certain age the, the hiring manager apparently that you know the, the the cranium blew off the front the the, the top of his head because <laughs> who asked me that you know when you have 30 people saying so what you know what am i going to get when can i get promoted after i like perform right. for you you know <laughs> What are, yeah, I, what's the vacation I, 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 me, policy? Me, me, me. What's yeah. the vacation policy? Yeah. You know, just basically, wow, what are you looking for in this candidate? What was something in my resume that you thought would really be like, wow, I, I'm interested in that. And how could I contribute to your success? Nobody asked that. Yeah. And yeah, it, it does, it's, it's not a gimmick either, by the way. It's not just me saying, here's how you stand out. Wouldn't you want to know that anyway? Because that is an opportunity for you to determine whether or not the kind of work that's going to create success in that organization is the kind of work you want to do. So it's, it does set you out. It is an interview technique or a gimmick, but it's also something you'd kind of want to know anyway. Yeah. I think everyone should take time to, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you journal or whatnot, but take some time to sit down and really answer that question for yourself. If you're going to, give of your time, your energy, you know, your resource, your vitality to this organization, you know, what is it that you would need to bring to the table to have that be successful? And not because you're trying to be loyal or, or um, to the company, because, you know, they're going to make their decisions. You obviously want to protect yourself in some way and don't overgive. But I, I think anything that you add to your skill set, that you add to your uh, wisdom or ability, can only help you in the future in crafting sure. whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. Well, those are the kinds of things that we talk about when I do a career letters consult. So, um, you know, with the career letters, uh, which is careerletters.com, you know, what I do is I first of all, once you've paid, I ask you for your current resume. And then I'm also going to ask somebody, what are the two or three jobs you're looking to go after? Can you mm -hmm. send me links to those? Let's, let's format your resume so it works well with AI. But then also let's, let's, you know, um, let's pack that with keywords that attract jobs like that so that not only are you going to be more successful going after the jobs you know, but maybe recruiters might be looking for you. So you might be able to get access to jobs you didn't know you didn't know was out there. Um, so we do that. And then part of that, no matter how much AI is out there, and so many of these resume writing companies utilize a lot of AI where you'll never talk to a human being. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but I actually look somebody square in the electronic eye here over Zoom and I ask them what's important to you and let's design it based on that. So as much as you can automate resumes, um, there's no automating that human connection, listening for what's important to somebody and then crafting a resume that, that attracts that, crafting a dating profile that attracts that as you know, going back to that as well. And that has been highly successful. Um, one of the things I also think is egregious on LinkedIn, you know, that easy apply button makes it really easy to just apply and upload your resume and you're done. But I tell people, don't do that. You can hit the easy apply button, but before you upload your resume, make sure that resume conforms with the job you, you're applying for. So make sure you're utilizing some of those keywords. 
that kind of thing, because um, those those things will make a difference. At the end of the day, a human being is going to pick who comes in for the second interview, but it's the robot eyes. It's the AI robot eyes that will sort the pile that you really want to master. And that's that's what we take AI and we turn it on its head and leverage it to make sure that you're at the top of the resume pile. And then we also offer that human touch to actually get on a Zoom call with you and understand what you're looking for next. And, and that really helps delivering that in the way that an AI algorithm just can't. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm hearing is like, it's really just to kind of recap everything is that one, when you get clear on your personal mission, you know, your personal mission statement and vision for your life, you know, you're going to look for and find things that actually match that. But then two, just like with the dating apps, it, you know, the AI job recruitment uh, tools, but also the dating apps, there's a way that you need to organize and format your profile so that it actually gets through the filter so that a human human being can actually see that profile, see that person, and then have a conversation. And then how you show up in that conversation is what's going to make the difference in whether you get that that job, that position, that relationship, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there could be, and I get this all the time, like, I, I used to do this job. I used to work in that company. I want to get back to that company. Why did I not even get a callback answer? You know, and the reason is, is that somebody probably optimize their AI resume so that the AI robot eyes move that person to the top. You're over here. And I tell people all the time too, it's like a Google search. You know, if you put Chinese restaurants near me, how often do you go to page six to find the Chinese restaurant? Uh, page, I don't even go to page two. Yeah. You don't even go to page two. So why, what would make you think that a hiring manager that's got 46 resumes in front of them, if they go through the first 15 and they find three candidates, they're not going to go down to the rest of the 40. So you want to just make yeah. sure that you're in the top third. I don't guarantee yeah. a job, but I guarantee that you're going to get increased traffic for yeah. sure. And then you have to make your yeah. own luck. Yeah. You increase their opportunities to be seen. Absolutely. Yeah. And that goes for, that goes for jobs and for dating for yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, we're getting close to our time here. I always like to ask everyone that comes on is what is one piece of wisdom that you would share? It doesn't have to be related to the topic for today, but just one piece of wisdom that you would like to impart to anybody that's watching today. I go back to the mission statement, aspire to inspire in the universe takes notice. Uh, my business really started to expand when I stopped measuring it by units and measuring it by people impacted, as I said a little earlier. So it definitely is, how many people do I reach with, you know, how many units did I move from the, for books? That's another example. Um, I've had some really great successful years as an author. And the one that always sticks with me is, uh, a woman that told me she she ordered 40 copies of my book one Christmas. And I was like, I called her. I said, this must be a mistake. It's 40. Did you mean four? And she said, no, I meant 40 because my mother was in a chemo chair and that book made her laugh and she passed away. And I want to give that book to everybody that she loved so that they could read what she was reading that lifted her spirits during her darkest hours. What? Wow. You know, at the end of the day, that's what you want to be measured on, not the units. So yeah, um, I, I tell myself that a lot during those, you know, because you get tons of rejection from agents and TV producers. I mean, I'm just like every half the world. I'm trying to get into Netflix and all these other things. But I know that once I get in there, I can impact and reach people. But that can't be the game. You know, it has to be just yeah. what are you doing right now to impact people and their families? If you can help, if you can help a breadwinner, 
uh, be back into the job market earlier, employed sooner, you're impacting that whole family. That's what really keeps me going. And it can't just be about the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. It has to be about yeah. the impact you're making. So very yeah. long answer to your question, but I hope it, I hope the answer's in there somewhere. Oh, it's, it's just, all I can say is just thank you. Just thank you for what you just shared. I think that is one of the most impactful things um, that I just heard. Like I got, I have chills, right. From, from what you just shared. Um, and I think that's just the perfect place to, to kind of leave it. So if uh, we have yeah. to plug, right. We have to plug careerletters.com. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm gonna put Mike, all of that Mike, in the show Mike notes. <laughs> Her.com right there. There's my name somewhere there. All right. <laughs> Gotta plug some yes. websites. Yeah, career well, careerletters.com, of course. Um, for anybody that wants the resume writing, there is the love letters.com for anybody that wants their dating profile done. Um, love but if you want to keep up with everything uh with Mike, go to mikefarragher.com. Uh you know, umbrella website that we created for you to make sure that everybody has access to everything that you're doing. Um, and uh, where are you going to be this Saturday for anybody that's local? So this Saturday, I'm produced with Cap Basie Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey, the um, Irish American Film Festival. And I'm super excited about that. First of all, because one of my films is in there, The Last Temptation okay. of Mary, which is based on my sixth book. But um, we had such a successful festival last year that we took some of the profits and we we're actually flying in two young filmmakers from Dublin uh, that were part of the Dublin International Comedy Film Festival. So we have a yeah. partnership between the Count Basie, Dublin International Comedy Film Festival. We're flying these two young filmmakers in to give them the thrill of watching an American audience laugh at their comedy. And again, it's all about people reached. And yeah. The numbers will follow that, that it, i understand that we're nearing a sellout capacity so if you are planning on going um get a move on no irish are usually the last you know they, they do last minute plans do not get shut out of this one it's going to be a a yeah. really really special night i can't wait to give these dublin filmmakers a jersey welcome and just watch their faces light up it's gonna be awesome yeah, I, I'll be there. Uh, so I can't wait to see that as well. And uh, Mike, thank you so much for being here today. I uh, really appreciate all of the knowledge and insights and wisdom that you shared uh, for everyone, whether it's on the business side, on the dating side, or just for wanting to make a difference and an impact in the world around them. Um, now is the there's never been a better time to write your own story and you as the chief storytelling officer are definitely an example of that and so thank you once again for being here and well, thank, i will thank you, you as all. well yeah yeah thank you yeah, as well because you've been you've been a great contributor to my business you've been a great friend um so i think your business yeah. insights on how to attract and, and gain your new customers or your business has been super valuable so thank you for everything yeah. you're doing uh, personally and professionally for me i really appreciate it yeah thank you for those flowers i've received them and accept them <laughs> <laughs> all right awesome take care, everybody take care thank you and uh, i'll see you all next week <laughs>